I have <laughs> very eager cat helping. I do want him to scoot out of the way so that I can cut without cutting him open, um, without cutting the wrong part of the sweater. He's slightly distracting. Hi, my name is Mark and welcome to the channel. Today I'm giving you the first installment of a little bit of project progress, project chronicling of my Bees Knees sweater by Thea Coleman of Baby Cocktails. If you've been here on the channel, you've seen me working on it, you've seen some of the progress in the last month, and so I'm bringing you part one of my adaptations and finishing work. This will probably be a two-part, maybe a three-part um, installment of videos. So stick around for part one. Let's get into it. front of me I have a bit of a mess, so let's dissect this, let's clean it up. I started this project at the beach and I don't regret it, it was really nice. I have a strong association now of this project with that experience of enjoying my time at the beach, um, enjoying my time on a family vacation, so I like to do that with projects. If I can, I try to start a project or work on a project at the same time as some sort of life event. So that's that could be going on a trip and choosing what project I'll work on for that trip. Since I'm a musician, it could be working on a project in conjunction with preparing a certain piece of music or preparing a certain concert or um, opera, whatever it is I'm working on. And in this case, I chose to line up this project with a really enjoyable family vacation, a traditional trip we take every year to Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. And it was nice. I took all the supplies I needed so I could get through most of the project, and I did. <laughs> so I'm cleaning it up in front of me. Uh, it's been in my bag, it's been in my suitcase since I got home a week ago, and I haven't worked on it. I've been working on other things. Excuse me. <laughs> I haven't worked on it, I've been working on other things. So. It's a beautiful sweater. I'm a big fan of the pattern, big fan of the project, and I made some adaptations. So a few people who've seen me working on this in other videos I've posted have already asked, are you working on this in the round? Did you change the pattern? So the pattern, I'll put a picture up here, is a cardigan, and so it has the open front, and it's instructed, it's uh, prescribed to be made flat, where you're working across the right side, you turn your work and reverse work across the wrong side. And if I can, <laughs> I will do anything to knit in the round. I really love knitting in the round. I like working the right side of my work every row, and I just enjoy it. <laughs> it's nicer for my brain, makes me happier. So. I talk about this a lot, because we're crafters, we often get to choose our own adventure. We get to change what fiber we want to use, what color we want to use. You can change techniques or design details. I mean, you can design from scratch. You can just think of something and make it, which is really cool. So I didn't adapt any of the pattern here. I just adapted the construction. So I wanted to work on this in the round, so I did. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in this video, in this part one of my bees knees journey. So as I untangle, the first thing I'm finding is a lingering darning needle or tapestry needle where I had seamed together my shoulders. And this is lingering because <laughs> my husband and I were on our way home and we had stopped at a Cracker Barrel to eat dinner. And there was maybe a 15, 20 minute wait for a table. So we were sitting in rocking chairs out front. A rocking chair is the perfect place to knit. And so I pulled out my sweater and unfortunately all of the fun knitting was over. It was just time to start seaming, join the shoulders, do some of the finishing work. So I, I got held up mid seam. So I'm just 
burying this tail, finishing my seaming here on the shoulder, and I'm going to snip that. Now I've got my darning needle back <laughs> and a little scrap. So I have a shoulder seamed and I had already seamed the opposite shoulder. And let's take a little look at what's going on here. It's still a little tangled, but I'm currently working these two flaps, which will wrap around. They're a continuation of the cable that runs up the front of the sweater. And it's going to wrap around the neck and behind my shoulders. I'll put a picture of that from the pattern up on the screen. I think it's a really, really beautiful design element. It's great that it carries the cable work around to the back so that if someone's behind you, they can still see a sneak peek of the beautiful cable details of your sweater. So I am at the point now where I'm finishing these wrapping pieces, the pieces that are wrapping behind me. So the shoulder, if any of this makes sense to you, <laughs> the shoulder is right here. And normally this would stop with it and that would just be the shoulder of the sweater. Instead, this continues and it wraps around behind the sweater where it will connect to the back, the um, back, the neck shaping that happened on the back side of the sweater. So let me get the rest of the slack out of the way. And as I do these two extensions of cable, I'm working from two different balls of yarn, which is why this is so tangled. And I threw it into my bag at a Cracker Barrel, and then I threw it into my suitcase, and I didn't get it out for a week. So all of those are the reasons. Now, a couple things need to happen. Because I worked this sweater in the round, I need to steek it. I need to reinforce my steek channel and cut the sweater open. I did that at the front of the sweater. You can see here the bottom hem. Each cable panel represents the edge where the open cardigan meets. So I've added a channel of seven stitches. I'll zoom in a bit. I've added a channel of seven stitches here in the middle. So you can see my three knits, a purl that dips down the center, and another three knits. I don't like... I don't love the way the color's showing up there. There we go. So that's the color of this. That's a better representation. I feel like it's looking different on every camera, but in real life it's gorgeous. <laughs> so I have my steak channel here that I need to reinforce and then I'll cut the center. Because this is a non-superwash wool, I could needle felt my steak, but I may go in with my sewing machine. I may just zoom through and do a stitch for a quicker alternative. Additionally, I have steaks at the armhole openings. Once I got to the armholes, I didn't want to work flat. I didn't want to turn the top portion of the front and the back and work the right side and wrong side. I wanted to keep going in the round because it makes me happy. So I bound off or stopped where the armhole should start and then on my next round, I cast on another channel of steak stitches. So you can see those here along the side, and then it opens up at the tip top. So this whole thing will be cut open to make my armhole. And I have the same thing on the opposite side. At the top, the neck is already open. So I just need to reinforce the central steak and the two armhole steaks, then I can cut them open. The next thing I need to consider for this finishing is, with the extension of those two cable sections, I'm wondering if I can measure out and join the right length to see where they will sit, where they will, where they will fall, before I steek. I might need to reinforce and steek everything before finishing those pieces, but I'm crossing my fingers that I'll be able to gauge it before steeking. So anyway, that's what we're doing here. We're gonna look at this and see how much needs to be added to finish off those extensions. All right, looking at the back of the sweater, we'll have these pieces. 
that wrap around and eventually become seamed to this section. And eventually they will meet in the middle. I think I'm pretty close. So one tip that the designer gives is to steam this section first, give it a steam block, and then take the fabric, line it up where it meets, and use um, locking stitch markers, safety pins, anything like that to line up the fabric so that you know how much fabric you need to make sure that everything lies flat. It looks to me like I still need about an inch from each side. Now the other thing to know is that to keep the cables in pattern, eventually we just go to a two by two rib. So we don't want to interrupt the cable pattern somewhere random. We want to make sure they meet where all of the cables line up in a logical fashion. And then we can either Kitchener stitch them together, we can graft them, or we can mattress seam them. I think I want to use a Kitchener stitch because I don't want as much bulk from the mattress seam inside the sweater against my neck. So part of my decision making here deals with laziness. I need to reinforce these steaks, and I think it's a good idea to go ahead and do it before knitting more. <laughs> to sew them, I would need to go downstairs and get my sewing machine out, plug in the extension cord, and sew. To needle felt, I have my stuff right here, but needle felting will take longer. The other side of the coin is that if I use this on my sewing machine, there's potential that it will get sucked into the machine and I will have to rip it or cut it out, which happened to me recently with another sweater. So I'm going to needle felt one of the armhole openings to start, and then we'll cut that open. The others I may sew. You'll find out. I'll find out. Let's go. So for my needle felting, I have a nice thick block of foam, and I have a nice needle felting tool. The tool it's always scary to do this because they're so sharp, has a series of barbed needles. You can see the little notches in the needles. So as I pass through the wool and then on the return pass of the needles, the barbs catch the wool and help felt it quickly. They help agitate all of that more rapidly than just um, stabbing at it with a singular plain needle. So I'm putting the foam under the section that I need to reinforce. And I think if I put it diagonally, I can fit almost the whole steak section on there. This amount of steaking is not bad, or this amount of reinforcement is not bad. The bigger task will be doing the front channel of the sweater because it's like 28 inches long. That's a lot of fabric to uh, needle felt. So now I just go. I'm just stabbing along the section of stitches that I reserved for the steek. I think one of the definitions of steek is a bridge, which I think is a really good way to think about it. When you have a steek panel, you are creating a bridge of stitches that get you from one part of your fabric to another, and later we can take the bridge away to reveal the river or whatever it is, the canyon that we're crossing over. If you're not interested in needle felting or sewing a reinforcement, you can do a couple of other things. You could go in with a crochet hook and you could crochet stitches along the steak panel to reinforce it. Or you could go in by hand with needle and thread and tack it down. But I think needle felting is a very cool way to do it because it's so secure. Um, no one can undo the felting. Once it's felted, it's felted forever. You can't pick it away. You can't pull the crochet chain out. You can't cut the threads or snip the threads. It will always be nice and sturdy. So 
So I'm focusing my needle felting on the center of this channel. You could felt the whole thing if you really wanted to, but I'm gonna cut right down the center where my purled ridge is. So that's where I'm stabbing. Okay, I've done several passes. I'm gonna lift it. And ideally I'd like to flip this inside out because I always like to reinforce from both sides. Now that I've turned this over, you might be able to see it's getting a bit fuzzy. And it's starting to felt. Okay, I think that's great. The reason that I'm doing this video, bringing you this part of the video before the full sweater is finished, I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. One, I really like this pattern. I just want to spend a little bit more time with it on the channel. Two, uh, it's much easier for me to do this stuff in real time if I can talk about a project, talk about what I'm doing in the same moment that it's actually happening, and then get that edited, present it to you. It makes so much more sense than me doing this now and waiting another two, three, four weeks before the sleeves are done, before the button band is picked up, before it's blocked again, and then I have time. Sorry, the cat is, um... <laughs> we have a cat visiting. You can see the tail there. <laughs> Hi, buddy. So anyway, it just makes sense for me to go ahead and do some of this and present some of it in real time. Now he's probably on my microphone. So I, I hope you enjoy seeing more of the process, um, more of the pacing of what it takes to get one of these garments completed. So now I'm ready to cut the steak panel. I have <laughs> very eager cat helping. I do want him to scoot out of the way so that I can cut without cutting him open, um, without cutting the wrong part of the sweater. He's slightly distracting. Okay, so we're gonna cut and I have arranged my stitches so that I have a ditch. I have a purl ditch in the middle. And the only thing here to be careful of is that you're not cutting through more than one layer of fabric. So you could put something between the layers of fabric so that you don't accidentally cut through your good knitting. I like to use a little pair of scissors because I find that it requires me to make little short snips, which just gives me more time to double check that everything looks right, that I'm cutting in the right place, and that I'm not getting any extra fabric. If I were to use an enormous pair of scissors, I think I could accidentally do much more damage. Hi, buddy. Okay, we've cut through. Uh, now, once I have it cut, I'll, I'll inspect. <laughs> I'll inspect to see that there's nothing I need to reinforce more. Sometimes I'll go through and separately stab these parts. Let me just demonstrate that in case you're sticking for the first time and you wanna take extra care to make sure that everything is felted really well. Oh! Okay, that is super well felted. Hopefully you can see that there. You can see the texture looks like felt. It's fuzzy, it's mangled, and then next to it you have the shinier stitches still with their integrity. So not super time consuming. That didn't take me all day. It probably took me, I don't know, five minutes, maybe 10 minutes to do that armhole opening. So it would be another 10 for the other armhole opening and then probably 
a good 30, 40 minutes to do the whole front channel. So for the front channel, I think I will be going downstairs, getting the sewing machine out, and I'll take you along with me to see that process. So I'll see you there, and then hopefully I'll check in when we finish that top portion and get the body of the sweater completed. All right, here we are, we made it downstairs and I have the sewing machine set up. I've set my stitch length to two millimeters and I'll just be using a straight stitch. Fingers crossed again that the sewing machine does not eat my work. And I'm going to start at the bottom hem of the sweater and my plan is to run a stitch down one side and then another stitch down the other side of the steak panel. So let me try to get going. All right, so far so good. So normally when I try to do this, if the machine is going to eat my fabric, it happens instantly, but uh, we made it, made it a little ways, so I think we're good to keep going. So I've done my first stitch. We'll look at this close up um, upstairs under my better cameras. But you can see, maybe you can't see, there's just a little stitch running down the first side of my steak panel. And now I'm just going to review to make sure that I'm never leaving that channel. Because when I go to snip, I wanna make sure that it stays, that it retains its integrity. Okay, so that center sewing was definitely faster than needle felting it. Um, I like the look of needle felting better. I think it is so discreet. Once you've felted the edge of your fabric, you can fold it back and tack it down lightly with your felting needle. And it just looks very natural, very discreet. When you have the sewn edge, it's not as pretty on the inside, but it's the inside, so how much does it matter? It depends. It depends on what's important to you for your project. So maybe in the future, um, I don't know when I'm not as crazed to get through so many sweaters, I might spend more time and needle felt everything. But for now, that's not my priority. My priority is to explore projects and work through things that are at the top of my list that I'm really excited about. So this is a good shortcut for me at this time. <laughs> so let me get this other armhole sewn and then we'll be, up, we'll be all set to look at everything up close upstairs. Okay, we'll say goodbye to the sewing machine. All right, I'm back and sufficiently warm from being downstairs. Uh, an update for people that were concerned about me melting away in the crafting room on the second floor. I have an air conditioner, a window unit that I put in. So this room is very pleasant and hopefully with the microphone, um, it's isolating my voice a little bit so you're not hearing too much of the roar of the air conditioner. So now I can craft all I want, which is great, really exciting. So you were just downstairs with me from my other camera and I sewed the channels through these steaks. So let's take a close up look now that we have a better camera and some more focused lighting. And you can hopefully see the thread, it's white thread. Um, I guess if I were really together, really with it, I could go through and use coordinating thread. I could use a sort of dandelion yellow, mustard yellow for this, but I didn't. And again, this is gonna be on the inside of the sweater. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this open in the same place. And this time, because I haven't needle felted it, 
um, the yarn's going to go a bit further. The yarn is going to scramble itself a little bit. It's not going to sit in the same firm way it did after being needle felted, but by the time it reaches the sewn reinforcement, it will stop unraveling. And because this is a non-superwash wool, the goal is that with wear, with agitation, eventually any of those raw edges will felt naturally. But depending on how much you wear something and how you take care of it, that may not happen anytime soon. So you can see here some of the unraveling I'm talking about. This didn't happen with our needle felted edge, but by the time we hit the sewn line, um, this isn't going to be going any further. That's going to keep it nice and tidy. So that's one reason I like the needle felted edge better. Um, you don't have quite as scrambly of an edge. Of course, you could more carefully sew the exact column of stitches next to the steek, and that would do the trick for you, but I'm not trying to spend too much time at the sewing machine with my hand knits, just out of fear that I might um, get it caught in the machine. I might mess up fabric that I've spent dozens of hours knitting. So I'm not gonna risk that. I'm gonna go into this edge now, just at the top, and do a little bit of stabbing because I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm nervous. Really, it shouldn't be going anywhere because of the seam we've sewn. But I think if you wanna take an extra precaution, you should, nothing wrong with that. So again, I'm just trying to target the areas at the top and the bottom of this armhole opening where there might be a little more pressure, a little more um, of a stress point in the garment. Now for the front panel. On the front panel, I was a little more careful, a little more meticulous to sew directly into the channel of stitches next to the ditch where I'll cut. And I wanna be totally careful here that I keep the layers of the sweater separated. So I'm going to use my foam block. You could use a book, a notebook, um, piece of cardboard, anything to be sure that you're not cutting through two layers. So I'm just setting this between the layer we'll cut and the good layer at the back of the sweater. And we're just gonna cut this puppy open. So if you're watching along with me and you're not sure why I chose to do this in the round, as I said, I really like to work the right side. I like to be looking at the finished side of the fabric as I knit, because it's a happier experience for me. I'm a continental knitter, and so my knits and pearls are not identical in size. My pearls are a little bit bigger. So if I'm doing a piece of stockinette fabric that's knit flat, I will purl my rows with a smaller needle. So I just use my interchangeable set and I put a smaller size needle on one side, a normal size needle on the other, and it makes my stitches look perfect. For something like this with cables and texture, I don't wanna use two different size needles because I'm not just knitting on one side and purling on the other, I'm doing a combination of knits and purls constantly. So it wouldn't be a huge difference for a textured sweater like this, but I would prefer it look as good as it can, so I want to knit, be on the right side for every row, and I, uh, I also just like following the pattern that way. I don't like to work the reverse side of cables as much as I like to work the front side of them. So all of that to say, if I had worked this sweater flat, as it's prescribed in the pattern, I wouldn't have to do any of this extra work. I wouldn't have to cut and reinforce all of my steaks. The sweater would just be ready to be seamed at the shoulders and then pick up the button band, pick up the sleeves. So that's totally my doing, totally my choice. But some people asked about it, and for those of you out there who really prefer to work in the round, this is a great option. If you're working with really any fiber, you can steak it. If you're working with acrylic, if you're working with cotton, something that's not going to felt, 
you can sew a reinforcement. You have to have a machine, you have to be willing to do that, but you'll be able to reinforce so that your project won't unravel. If you're using a non-superwash wool, then it's even easier because you can needle felt, you can let it felt naturally, there are lots of options for you. So that's why I'm here <laughs> doing these extra steps. It made a big difference for me as I was making the sweater. And I would do it again. I would do it the same way. I would make dozens of cardigans in the round and cut them open because it's a better experience for me, for my brain, for my hands. So again, we get to choose as crafters the way we want to execute a project and what's important to us in the finishing. So that's something that is important to me. Okay, lots of talking. <laughs> Let me get to the next step. I'm just going to show you one more thing in this portion of the project check-in, and then I probably won't see you until the project is complete, maybe until we're picking up the button band and doing that finishing. So the end of today's video, the next step is to make sure these uh, extended panels at the neck are the right length, and we are going to Kitchener them, graft them together. Let's go. So as the designer recommended, um, I'm going to pin down these extended pieces to make sure that they line up as precisely as possible. So you can see a little bit more of the front of the cardigan now that it's open. We have this beautiful cabled channel running up and then the textured side of the sweater. Once we hit the shoulder, you can see where this separates. The cable channel keeps running and that's going to wrap around the back behind the neck. So I'm going to grab some locking stitch markers and we will start to pin this in place and see how much more length, how many more rows approximately I need to work. A lot of people ask me about this case. I'm sorry if you've already heard, but I'll tell you here in case you're seeing it for the first time and you like it. This is a little jewelry organizer. You can see the diamond on the front and it's connected. This can't come out all the way. It's got three clear sections that zip, so I keep fixed circular or shaped markers, locking markers, and mm, I forget the word I was going to use, but like decorative cutesy markers in the last. And then I have room at the bottom for some tape measures, some larger markers, and at the top there's a stretchy pouch, and then a nice snap where you could slide your rings, you could slide other markers? I don't know, you could put other notions there. So the whole thing folds up really nicely and zips. It's not tiny, but it's not large. Uh, it could fit into your project bag easily if you needed to take all of your markers with you in case you really need to use a lot for your project, or if you're seaming together a big granny square project or pieces of a sweater and you need all of your markers, it's nice to have them in one place. So this is one of my favorite Notion um, organizers and it is from My Tagalongs. I'll put that on screen as I'm saying it. My Tagalongs, and this is the cobalt blue jewelry case. I got it at a boutique in Shaker Heights near the yarn shop I go to. So they also sell it online. Hopefully you'll be able to find one if you want one. Anyway, people ask, and so I wanted to say it in the video so I don't miss the comments of people politely asking where it came from. So at this point, um, the designer actually said I should steam the portions of the sweater to make sure that they are extending to match the width, uh, the other direction of fabric running across the neck. So I have my steamer here. Somebody asked me what kind of steamer I have, and when I looked it up <laughs> to get the information for them, they don't sell it anymore because there's a big lawsuit against the company because a lot of people have suffered burns. So I've never had an issue. I like my steamer. You don't need to know what kind it is because you can't buy it. Uh, they're stuck in a lawsuit. But it's a nice small steamer. <laughs> I've had it for years and so it's what I'm going to use to lightly steam this part of my work. And hopefully, again, fingers crossed, that's like the theme of this video, I'm not going to suffer any burns from it. It's amazing to me how much fabric changes when it's steamed, how much wool changes when it's blocked, when it's soaked. It's incredible. I guess if you really wanted to, if you're making this sweater, 
at this point you could start tacking it down, but I don't want it to be um, an awkward angle to finish knitting. Usually I loathe finishing work. I hate seaming things together, but I think this is such a beautiful design feature that I do not mind it. I'm kind of excited about this process of grafting together and then um, tacking it all down, seaming it all together. I think it'll be beautiful. It looks like with things pinned down, I need to work about an inch more each direction before I join, which means I cannot do another repeat of the cable chart. My tape measure, this is from my local shop around the table yarns in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Great shop. I think I need one inch more on each side. And then we'll craft together. So as I mentioned, we're no longer working in the cable pattern. We are just uh, knitting a two by two rib so that we can join it more easily. So I'm just going to take one pin out on each side and then we'll join. I hope this isn't too boring. I always wonder if I should be more wild on camera and maybe one day I will be, but right now this is <laughs> more authentically me. So technically I did it. I reached the length I needed working in two by two rib, but I'm a little sad about it. I think I would prefer to see the cables running as long as they can. So I'm thinking I'm going to pull back these five rows, maybe six, seven rows to get to the point I need. And I'll continue doing one more repeat of my cable chart hoping that I can uh, block things out so that it's not puckering, it's not drawing too tight, it just fits. So taking out just a little bit of work, maybe 10 minutes of work, and redoing it to get the result I really want. So that's why we're doing this, that's why we're really breaking down the process of what it takes to get your sweater project from start to finish and for you to be happy with it. So a little bit of pulling back, I rarely do this, but here's an opportunity that I think calls for it. I think I'm going to be happier with the sweater if I can see a little bit more of that cabling running across the back. Okay, in this rare moment of pulling back, I thought we'd do it together. So I pulled my needles out of the work and I'm pulling back uh, something like six or seven rows. I want to get about to this point. So I'm pulling back and this is great. Wool is so stable. Wool does such a good job of holding its shape that I can pull back really without any fear. And I think this next row is where I want to be. Okay, I'm gonna check this against the other side. Yep, I think that's it. So now I'm going to pick these stitches back up. And the wool is being so kind to really hold its place for me. And as I pick up, I'm gonna to try to get the stitches all uh, facing the right way so that they're not twisted. But in case I pick something up the wrong way, when I get to it and work it, I always work the stitches as they present. So if a stitch has been twisted for whatever reason, I'll work into the back leg of it to untwist it um, or vice versa. And another tip as I'm picking these stitches back up, I'm just squeezing the work underneath so that I'm not uh, yanking the ne next stitch out as I pick up the stitch prior. Okay. So now I think we're all set for me to redo those last few rows and try to get things picked up. 
with the cable pattern continuing. All right, I'm back and I'm in different clothes because it's a new day. I was sitting at the desk trying to finish my benchmark, my goal of the day with this project, and I couldn't get it done last night. I, I pulled back, as you recently saw, I pulled back the strips to have more of the cable pattern, and then I re-knit, and after doing all of that, I knew the grafting was going to take too long to get it right, so I paused for the night, and then I came back today, and I pulled back again, and I re-knit because I had spaced out and started the cable chart in the wrong place. I picked it up, um, kind of conjuncting, squishing one of the cable patterns, so <laughs> a lot of redoing, a lot of finishing to try to get this right. And then, uh, as I sat down to attempt to graft this, it was a headache because it's it's kind of complicated, kind of fussy to go in with your tapestry needle and do the Kitchener stitch to graft, especially with a two by two rib or a one by one rib, because the stitches don't line up exactly. There's a little jog. And so I did my stitch across for about half of the stitches and they weren't lining up. The column of knits weren't meeting the other column of knits exactly. They were off by sort of a half stitch and that's the jog. So I wasn't happy with that. <laughs> so I pulled things back. I was watching TV as I did it just to pass the time. And I ended up using a three needle bind off. I flipped this upside down and you can see my small seam from the three needle bind off on the inside of the fabric. So I could have just bound off, as the pattern said, and used mattress stitch, mattress seam to seam it together, but I thought that was going to be too bulky. Anyway, here we are. I could have done it, I guess, many different ways, and I don't know which is the best. Part of me wants to take this apart and do it with mattress seam, which I'm really tempted to do since I already have a seam on the inside. I wanted it to be seamless because I'm making it myself. I thought if I can graft it and have no seam, that would be perfect, but I didn't love the grafting. So, oh, it's not a huge deal. It's not a huge seam, but you can see, you can see it come in, fold in on itself, and it doesn't continue the stitch pattern exactly. So I'm tempted now to pull it back out and do a little bit of mattress seaming which we might do. I have to mattress seam this, this separation between the extended collar and the back of the sweater anyway. So I might just pull things out, bind off each side, come back and mattress seam them. We'll see. But this video is going to end for today. I'm going to take this over to the mirror and try it on as is, just to see what the fit is like. This is pre-block, so the fit is going to shift once I soak and block the garment. And then of course I'll come back in with a button band and there's sort of a shawl collar and I'll have sleeves. So I'm gonna try it on now as it's sort of vest version, unfinished. And then I'll come back to you with a finishing video and sort of my final thoughts, my final review of working this pattern, working with this yarn choice, all of my thoughts. But so far I've loved working the project. I'm just taking all of this time today to try to adjust things to make them exactly to my liking. And I talked about it earlier in the video. That's what we get to do as crafters. So if you see an instruction in a pattern and it's not your favorite way to work a technique, you can change it. Of course, this is a good example. If you change it and veer off of the pattern, it might be more time consuming and it might result in trial and error and you might have to pull back until you get it right. So. That's the glory, that's the joy of it. We really get to customize as we go and there's no time limit, there's no deadline. The sweater is for me, so I just wanna keep playing around with it and see if I can get it to be as close to what I'm imagining as possible. So I'm gonna go try this on and then I'll see you back here for an official goodbye. Okay, I feel like I'm wearing a terrible assortment of colors <laughs> to try this on with, with my maroon and my striped shirt and everything else going on, but uh, the fit I think is pretty good. I've got plenty of room around the sides and back, so once this is blocked I can get um, plenty of generous space if I need it, or I can kind of block it 
more modestly to the measurements that it's currently at. So I think it's beautiful. Sorry, I'm just realizing with a microphone, I might be hitting it as I'm doing all this, but I think it's a great fit so far. Uh, uh, I'll have a little more length. There's such squish and stretch to this stitch definition or to this stitch pattern. So I think by the time I've soaked it and lay it out, I'll be able to customize things like the exact length, the exact fit that I want. And I'll have a button band added, the shawl collar, and sleeves. So this is it so far. <laughs> Not the best setup to try it on, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how it's going. And the steaks are holding up just fine. The channels that I sewed and the channels that I needle felted. So that's good to, to get an idea of what it's like now that I've cut it all open. All right, I appreciate you being here with me today. I hope this video appealed to you in some sort of way. Maybe you like to see the process, the behind the scenes of what goes into working on a larger project, like a sweater, a cardigan, and I just appreciate you choosing to spend some time with me. I have all sorts of other videos on the channel, lots of things coming up, a big trip this summer to the UK, um, a lot of stuff that I'm excited to share with you. So you can see more of what I do, you can play a bigger part in the channel by supporting me over on Patreon, subscribing to the channel is a great way to support me, leaving a comment and connecting, all of that helps me and it's really rewarding for me to hear from you and to hear who is watching these videos and what you like. So let me know what's going on in your life with your projects and I hope you've found something enjoyable, insightful, um, something you've identified with in today's video. So as always, thanks for being here with me. Happy knitting, happy crocheting, happy crafting to you, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.